There's a story inside every smoke shop, with every cigar, and with every person. Come be a part of the cigar lifestyle at Boveda. This is Box Press. Welcome to another episode of Box Press. I'm your host, Rob Gagne with Boveda. Today, I'm going to be having a cigar out on the patio at Boveda headquarters in Minneapolis with one of the biggest icons in the cigar industry, Pete Johnson of Tatuaje Cigars. On our previous episode, Pete was focused on his business and his brand and how he's been a disruptor in the industry. But today, we're going to take a much deeper dive in the personal conversation, which I thoroughly enjoyed and I think you will as well. One thing that stuck out to me during this conversation is how much a true artist Pete really is. His passion for the art of cigars, music, fashion, and even wine, it really comes out during this whole conversation. And it's something that helped me get a little bit closer to knowing him more personally. And I think you'll understand him a little bit more personally as well. In this episode, we uncover Pete's love for animals, but more specifically for dogs. In fact, you'll find out he's named a few cigars after dogs. After hearing about this, we thought it was a great opportunity for us to show our support, set up a GoFundMe, and raise a little money for the charities whose main purpose is to help our furry friends. We picked two charities. Pete chose Gulfstream Guardian Angels Rottweiler Rescue, while Boveda has chosen Secondhand Hounds. We will be splitting the money raised 50-50 between these two organizations, also, both Tatuaje and Boveda will be matching up to $2,222. This number will make more sense after you watch the episode because Pete and I get into a little discussion about the angel number. Anyway, if you're a fan of our podcast or just a fan of dogs in general, we would appreciate you checking out the GoFundMe in the description and give what you can. We will keep this link up for about a month after we will launch this episode. So light up a cigar with Pete and I and enjoy the episode. Welcome to another episode of Box Press. I'm your host, Rob Gagne with Boveda, and I have Pete Johnson from Tatuai Cigars. Is that Thanks, how you Pete. pronounce your last name? Gagne, yeah. Gagne. Yeah. You switch yeah. it around a couple of letters, you get ganja, right? Yes, no? yeah. Yeah, you, no, could go, cool. you could go a lot of ways with that. <laughs> <laughs> we sat down a little bit at IPCPR with John, so that was a, that was a good blast. But we were talking about... Yeah, to him. Huber's a, a great dude. It's yeah. just always fun to just chit chat. And it's been a long time since we have done that with each other. So mm -hmm. it's kind of refreshing. Yeah, good. Yeah. We talked a little bit how you were a disruptor in the industry and all that kind of stuff. So that was fun. Just before we go any further, what are we smoking right now? Just so. Uh, we're actually smoking a cigar that I put together in the Miami factory on Monday. Um, wow. That's fresh. It's fresh. Very fresh. A little bit more moisture, obviously, but it. Tremendous burn yeah, already. It's burning great. Um, it would be considered medium full. What is being muted for you probably in the flavor profile, it would be the, the moisture. It's probably okay. calming it down a lot. Yeah. So you might be getting more of a medium out of it. But okay. it's, a, it's a pretty heavy smoke. Yeah? Yeah. One roller puts together these oddball customs for me every once in a while that I'm just experimenting in Miami. Sure. Playing around with a few new sizes and... Things that I used to do back in the old day that I decided to Bring it back. Well play with them again. Okay. So I, I used to play a lot more in the factory in Miami, and then over the years, Nicaragua took all my time. Okay. Uh, going down to Nicaragua, and, and to the point where even the rollers and the people in the Miami factory were like, "When are you ever going to do something new with right. us in Miami? Because everything is all about the new in Nicaragua. Everybody's doing Nicaragua, Nicaragua." So. I decided to uh, start doing more projects in Miami. Good. I can't increase production. I'm just shifting production. I want to talk a little bit about your brand because you've grown from like I thought zero. we weren't going to talk about anything. We're, we're going to talk about <laughs> so We're a talking bit about, about basketball. About, uh, no, I don't know anything about <laughs> basketball, so we're not talking about basketball. But you're known for, obviously, quality cigars. And I know that there's a little bit of a caveat there with Pepin and the way that he actually acquires tobacco and then how he actually cures it. So tell me how you have used that to your advantage. In the old days, uh, when we started the brand, people would say that uh, they would ask Pepin, like, so what type of uh, batoon are you putting on 
the tobacco for, for Tatuaje. They always thought that we would add like paprika or cayenne pepper or rum or vanilla to give the aromas and the, because they always like, why are the cigars so peppery? Sure. But the key is just to make sure that tobacco speaks for itself because if you, if you have tobacco that you top with something, it's going to taste right. not, it's not going to taste real. It's gonna, you're going to taste those false notes to it. You let the tobacco speak for itself, uh, it's going to be perfect. And that's what Pepin does. He just kind of, he wants to control the fermentation. He wants to control the process. He doesn't want to go in and buy finished product. Right. He wants to finish it himself. Because otherwise you're stuck with blending something that you may not quite know how to do or you're like, ah, it's yeah, I mean, not in the really old days we were stuck doing that because the Garcias didn't have all the farms. Um, in the old days he had to rely on good material from good suppliers. Uh, he didn't have the space. I mean, back in the old days in Miami, we had like Tupperware containers or igloos that were actually aging the wrapper. That's how, wow. because when we talk about those old days, you're talking a, I don't know, a three by five closet that was the aging room. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it held a couple thousand cigars. So it wasn't, wasn't big. So there wasn't a lot of space to, to right. really do anything. But yeah. I remember walking into the factory in those days, the small factory in Miami, and seeing igloo containers in the back, and that we would open up, and that's where he was letting the wrapper kind of stay cool and kind of rest before they would use it for the rollers. Wow. That's it. Amazing. Yeah. So humbling beginnings. So we're on this Pepin kick, and I've heard a couple of stories about the first time. So you had already tried to launch or are launching a cigar. You kind of, I don't know, we're not having success or penetration. And then Pepin comes to you and was like, hey, I want to blend some cigars for you and kind of blends you like three cigars that you're like, these aren't it. And well, tell us a little bit about how that went. It's a little, a little different. Uh, so in 1995, uh, I was in the cigar industry and my guitar player in my old band, his father uh, was an infomercial guy. Did pretty well for himself. You, you'll see him if you're up at 2.30 in the morning, you'll see this guy on TV all the time doing like the Paint Roller Plus and the Red Devil Grill. <laughs> and uh, he was a cigar smoker, and he calls me and says, Pete, you're in the cigar industry. It seems like everybody's smoking cigars. How about making a cigar? I go, I don't know. Uh, I go, I'd love to put my name on something, but uh, I just right. kind of inexperienced on the manufacturing side, so I don't know who I'd go to, I go, but I'm going to the Dominican Republic. Maybe I'll visit a bunch of factories. And of course, every factory that I wanted to make a cigar with didn't have time for me because they were too busy too with busy. the boom. Yeah. And the few factories that had availability were literally taking a cigar off their shelf and saying, we can make this for you. Yeah, I go, it's already made. Well, that's that's your cigar. I even know the the brand, the size, the... The flavor profile, I go, I don't want that. I want, like, a new cigar. They're like, yeah, we don't really have the time for that. I'm like, All right. okay, so I got back. This is 96, and I told my friend's father, I said, listen, it's not going to happen. I go, I, there's nothing down there that I can put my name behind because it's someone else's brand, right? and I want to be part of, like, a real project. So um, 2003 comes. My, Quite my, a bit. Was that 10 year lapse there? Uh, so you're talking eight years? Yeah, seven, eight years that wow. I, I just. And you're working at a cigar retailer at the I, time? So or? I was working for a place called Gus's Smoke Shop in uh, Sherman Oaks or Studio City, California. It's no yep. longer there. And then uh, I moved on to a place called The Big Easy, which is no longer there. Uh, that The last store for The Big Easy, they had multiple stores uh, closed, I want to say, a year and a half ago. Sad okay. day because Eric, the owner, was one of my best friends, and he, didn't room he just lost his lease. Yeah, didn't uh, Room One Hundred One make Big E for a cigar? No, or whatever? no, okay. I don't think so. Okay, I think that was for something else. Got but it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know either. I don't think so though. But um, I got hired by the Grand Havana Room to uh, be their director of retail, and I became gotcha. a corporate uh, behind the. The, uh, the desk behind a computer doing oh Excel spreadsheets, which was really boring. And uh, 
in 2003, my first dog that I've had for all my life as a kid in the Sunset Strip, I, you know, you're talking about 1991, 1992. I'm, I have a Rottweiler that I'm going everywhere with. Uh, Is that he, Hunter? Yeah, Hunter. He passes away. And um, I was just like to the point where I wanted to get out of the cigar industry. I didn't want to do it anymore. The industry was just kind of like, I go, I'm never going to own my own store. I'm going to be behind someone else's counter for the rest of my life. I feel like I have nothing to contribute here anymore. Um, so I, got to, I had to look for something different. And an old friend of mine named Ben Gehrman, who was a sales rep for Viazon, which Viazon was the original owner and distributor for Punch and Hoyle. Okay. He calls me and he says, uh, you still want to make a cigar? I go, yeah, I always wanted to make a cigar, but I actually want to be part of it and not be just like, here, Face. make me a cigar, and I'll slap my, na my name on it, and right. we'll be done with it. I want to actually sit in the room and, and work with the guy that's putting it together for me and right. create something. Well, he goes, well, I got a guy that I'm working for a new company called Tropical. Or they were an old company because I'm working for Tropical now. We got this new guy, and he, he I remember he called him Pepe or something like that. <laughs> we got this guy named Pepe that, that uh, is a really good uh, blender and roller, and I, I think I might be able to make you a cigar. I'm like, All right, send me a sample. He sent me a sample. I didn't like it. Yeah. And he calls me. Oh, you know, I, not really my style. I don't think it's really that good. I mean, this is a long story, so... I get uh, a phone call from Ben. He goes, don't worry. We're going to come to Los Angeles, and we're going to sit with Pepe. <laughs> <laughs> Pepin. And, but again, he didn't, he didn't pronounce right. it. Maybe call him Pepin or something like that. We're going to come in, and we're gonna, he's going to roll you some samples there. Okay. They show up. I meet this guy named Pepin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a guy named Paul Palmer, who uh, still works for Tropical. Okay. And Ben Garman, the the sales rep who doesn't work for the company anymore. Uh, but it was Ben's, for Ben, he was the direct connection of how Pepin and I met. Okay. And he rolled me three more cigars. They asked me, what do I like? I go, medium full, you know, on the stronger side. Three cigars. And they all kind of tasted very there. They were, okay. Right. That's a cigar. But nothing wowing. Uh, nothing wow. So I... I literally went down and grabbed Pepina Cuban cigar and myself the same cigar that I knew was smoking beautifully at the time. It was an old box. And I gave it to him. It was a small cigar, like a Petit Corona. And I said, uh, try this. And he takes a puff off it. You know, he smokes it. We're smoking it together. He goes, you want this? I go, I want that. I want, I want the cigar that you have in your head. I don't want the cigar that that people are asking you to make. Right. Because at the time, he's new to the United States, and everybody's like, hey, Wild, can right? you make me a Padron? Can you make me an Opus X? Can you make me, you know, this cigar, this cigar? I'm like, he doesn't know any of those cigars. He's never even heard of those people. Right. He's, he's been in Cuba all this time. <laughs> he knows what a Cuban cigar is supposed to taste like. Right. Because I wanted a Cuban cigar. That's what I... I was a nerd when it came to Cubans. And... uh the next cigar he rolled, I was like, there it is. Like, really? it was literally that quick. He rolled me about 10 cigars uh, to, to kind of keep and smoke over, like, a week period. Yep. And I called him after, I don't know, about seven days, and I said, the blend is falling a little flat, and it's starting to get a little bit of a, almost of a cigarette note to it. Okay. To where you end up having that little high note of spice that kind of like, you know, like the smell of a cigarette yep. kind of burns your nose a little bit. Yep. And they're like, oh, yeah, Pepin can fix that. We'll just, wow. we'll just, um, Twisties, you know, amp yeah. up the volume a little bit. Sure. And uh, the next sample that they sent me were perfect. So I went down with like, I don't know, I, I just refinanced my condo in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. So I had a little extra change in my pocket. <laughs> Um, Which is rare for Los Angeles. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I, I I bought really way before the boom of nice. the housing market. So I bought at the old the end of the 
at the beginning of the crash, yep. I bought when the, the prices were really low. And I ended up selling that place for like four times of what I paid for it. Nice. So it worked out a little, great. A little extra cash. So I went down, started a company, um, literally opened up a new bank account, got all my licenses, went to a, a night school class to, uh, for... to learn how to open up a business. I had no nice. clue. I had no clue how to like, how to how to like open up a business. I just know I, I knew I wanted to have my own, but I didn't know how to do it. Well, at least you're going to get resources, right? So I called every state board and every licensing company in California that I needed. I said, "Hey, listen, I don't know what license I need. Tell me what I need to do this. I'm going to import cigars from Miami." And I'm going to sell them from here. And they're like, okay, you need these two licenses. You need this resale license. You need all this. I'm like, okay, good. I'll get it all. Go down to Miami. And literally, I sit there and I watch my first production being done. And it was five rollers. Five rollers. Pepin was one of them. Uh, wow. There's a lady that's been working with the family since that day. She still works uh, and wow. rolls some of the best cigars in Miami. <laughs> uh, Jaime. Uh, was okay. doing a little bit of rolling, but also in charge of um, of uh, packaging okay. and uh, quality control. Uh, Jaime's wife was rolling. Jaime's wife is one of the best rollers I've ever seen roll cigars, but she doesn't roll anymore. She's she's now a mother, and she yeah, uh, got other she, duties. Yeah, she does the household stuff now. But. Uh, I always joked that she was the reason why I got the number four cigar in the world because she was the roller. Um, and the joke in the, with nice. the family is that she's a better roller than Jaime. <laughs> um, Yanni and her mom were actually sorting leaves and packing sure. boxes. But uh, it was just one of those moments of like, okay, this is getting real. Right. I feel like I'm a little bit more part of it, but at the time, I didn't sit there and, like, blend the cigar. Pepin blended right. the cigar. Since then, what he's taught me over the years has been all the knowledge that he's given me and all the information that he's passed on, along with Jaime educating me also, because Jaime's an agronomist. Um, I've been able to go in the factory and talk to the chief of production and say, I need this, 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 and this. Sure. And a little more hands on there. They let me do my own thing because they have other clients to handle and I get to play in their their playground. So nice. But that's the long story. It was like It's good. The you first three cigars weren't that great. Yeah, that's um, what I heard. They became special. Great. Yeah. Well, it's it's a interesting way to start that relationship. Like, wow, you really went to the right guy then or that right guy got dropped in your lap and it's like, the right exactly place at the right, right time for for both of us i mean i i didn't know him he didn't know me he didn't right. know my reputation in the industry i had been in the industry already for a long time mm -hmm. all the manufacturers knew me um no one knew who he was aside from really? that he was working just well i mean he was in the center of the start. island you're talking about a, a famous person person from bias cuba is not really that famous right um if Pepin were living in havana there's a there's a saying that you would have become havana famous because okay. when all the really special rollers that lived in havana everybody knew about them like if you were a cigar geek you knew their names okay. you knew what they rolled their style of roll you knew how they packed their cigars there was actually a guy named uh, rodolfo tabuada that was super famous in havana Worked at the La Corona factory and the Partigas factory. Okay. And I went to Cuba in, for my first trip in 98. And mm -hmm. I went into La Corona. I said, uh, does Rodolfo Tabuada work here? I'm like, no, he's at the Partigas factory. So we went over to the Partigas factory. And I walked in. I saw this guy sitting at a table rolling cigars. And I, I said, what's your name? He goes, Rodolfo Tabuada. I go, you're the guy. And... I only knew him because he packed cigars the way I like to do this in the foil paper. I mean, he he would take his fresh cigars and he'd pack them in these foil bundles, and they became like cult cigars in Los Angeles. People were paying really? crazy money for weren't a bundle you, of Tabuadas. Uh, weren't you kind of configuring some sales between Cubans and, uh, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe some people who maybe might want them? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so you really were, like, 
uh, a good connoisseur of Cuban cigars and you knew who the rollers were and you were really kind I of the knew. guy to go to. Like if I was like, hey, I kind of want to try Cubans, I'd come to you at your shop and be like, what should I try? I was uh, I was the encyclopedia. I mean, that's amazing. I, I was the, the kid that people would come to and ask me, what am I supposed to be smoking or what am I supposed to be buying? Um, I, I dabbled with a friend in uh, selling Cuban cigars in the early 90s. And I got to the point where people in the industry started knowing me. And they knew me as, oh, that's, you know, the, the kid with tattoos. And, oh, he's a, he knows a lot about cigars. He knows everything about the Fuente brand. I had an Opus sure. X tattoo on my arm. Still do. And was, you know, hanging out with all the best people. You know, right. The Padrones, Manolo Casada, and Carlito Fuente, and Carlos Sr. And, and I looked at my buddy that I was kind of a business partner with in that, and I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I said, the business, that side of the business is yours. I said, I'm going to... Was that Danny? No. Okay. That was someone else. All right. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and uh, be like the serious guy in the industry, and I'm not, sure. I don't want to be known as like, oh, yeah, he's a good kid, but... He, all he does is he hawks Cuban cigars. I didn't right. want to be known as that guy. Sure. And eventually I wanted to lead into doing my own brand. Of course, that didn't happen for actually what would it be eight, nine years after right. I gave up the slinging Cuban thing. So it was <laughs> fun. Man, I, you know, I wasn't the best kid when I was <laughs> younger. And I, I will tell you, I drove, drove across the border a few, more than a few times. Sure. I used to go to a guy's house in, in um, right close to the border but in the united states and go through a couple hundred boxes of cuban cigars to find the best 20 really and i would open every box and he'd just be angry he goes you were the pain you he told me he he tells me he goes dude you were my worst client (laughs) he's you would open up every box of cigars i go yeah but because i'm trying to make sure that the who i'm getting it to has quality also because if they get shit from me, that means I have right. to bring you that shit back. And he goes, well, I'm not going to take it back. I go, I'd see, there you go. Then I'm let's stuck spend with the it. Na- let's spend the time now, then. I actually picked up a Rottweiler from him one day. He had a litter of puppies. Uh, so as, I'm, as I have like 40 boxes of Cuban cigars in, in a trunk, and, um, and my buddy's driving, and I have a Rottweiler puppy on my lap. <laughs> Her name was Havana. So, oh, nice. <laughs> fitting, right? Is that the second dog you <laughs> That was the second dog. Okay. Yeah. So the Tatuaje name, and I think I say it wrong. No, I you, hear other... you say it perfect. Tatuaje. It? Yeah. Tatuaje? I, I feel like... It's something... easy It's easy just to say tattoo and ahe really quick and just kind of let it flow. Tatuaje. Okay. All right. Tatuaje. And that's what the name means, right? Tattoo. Tattoo, yeah. So is that... Is the reason... Why you named it Tatuai is because you were known as the guy with the tattoos in the industry at, at the, the time? At the time, I only had the one sleeve. Right. But when I would walk onto the trade show floor in 95, 96, in the early days, I was the only guy with tattoos. Like, okay. the only guy. There was no... Right. There was no hardcore contingent. See, this is what I'm saying about in the, the, industry. Kinda, the, the subculture that you created in that kind of... And then I met John Huber, and we're like, right. oh, you got tattoos? Cool. I got tattoos, too. So we're like... You know, right. besties now, right? Right. Um, it was it was just never there, and of course, I had the Opus X tattoo on my arm, and everybody who who you know saw me would be like, "I want to see this Opus X tattoo." And the old man Fuente Car- Carlos Senior, uh, you talk like this, you know that real yeah. heavy scratchy voice, and he goes, "You're the crazy kid with the the Opus X tattoo," and I go, "Yes, sir." And he goes, "I don't know, man." That's crazy. <laughs> and they all called me Tattoo Pete. So if you look at it, you know, guys like Carlito Fuente and Carlos Sr. and Wayne Suarez, who was Cynthia's husband, yep. they nicknamed me Tattoo Pete. So all my life, Fitting. I've been called Tattoo Pete from the cigar guys. Sure. So when you're trying to think of a brand name, I was looking through everything. Really? I had one that referenced like a seller, you know, like. Okay. I had another one called uh, La Riqueza, which I ended up not using, but I'm glad I didn't use it because I didn't realize it was an old Cuban brand. Oh, good. I just liked the name because it meant the wealth or the riches. Okay. And uh, then I ended up sell- settling with Tatuaje. I right. actually asked a busboy at the Grand Avenue, I said, 
what's the Spanish word for tattoo? And he goes, tatuaje. I go, can you spell that for me? <laughs> and I ended up that doing graphics. famous. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up doing graphics and making the, uh, the, the cliche and the logo. And, nice. And uh, the Garcias didn't understand it until I walked in the room. They saw. Oh, yeah. They are like, tatuaje. Like, who wants to have a cigar called tattoo? Like, what is, what is that? What is it? Right. What does it mean? And I walked into the room for the first time. They saw me with the sleeve, and they're like, oh, okay. All right. We, we got get it. it. Yeah. So it's always been a nickname. Nice. But even, like, to this day, people still call me Tattoo. They're just like, that's it. But now there's thousands of people in our industry that have tattoos. Right. Thousands of people wearing skinny jeans. Thousands of people <laughs> wearing Converse. <laughs> so what drew you to dr- smoke cigars? I've heard a story that you saw a celebrity... Yeah. Smoking a cigar, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to try one of those. I was watching, like, one of these news shows. Um, I, it might have been just the local news. Mm-hmm. Because, it, you know, obviously the Entertainment Tonight's and those E's and all those, they've been on for a long time. But I think it might have been, like, a local news. And uh, there was, like, a quick blurb about the celebrities getting together for a charity function. And they were all smoking cigars. Which celebrity was it? No, there was a bunch of them. Oh, just a bunch. You yeah. saw a bunch of them. It's just a bunch of them in like this, you know, the patio setting, in well dressed, and they're all puffing away on cigars. I go, I, you know, I used to, I like a, I smoked a cigar when I was a kid. You know, like yep. I experimented with it, but I never actually smoked a premium cigar. Right. So I went out and I, uh, I got uh, a fifty cent cigar from the local <laughs> uh, liquor store. Okay. And wasn't a premium either, but it was better than what I smoked when I was younger. Sure. First one I smoked was a Have a Tampa. I don't know. You know, nothing special. And this one was maybe just a hair up. A hair up. <laughs> the uh, the Have a Tampa to this one would be going from a two in quality or a one in quality to maybe a three. Okay. So I said, you know what? This is pretty peaceful. Like, I sat on my back patio, smoked sure. this cigar, didn't understand the culture yet. This cigar actually had a hole in it already, so I didn't have to get a cutter. Um, lit it up the next day, so I only finished, like, half of it. Or How was that? Uh, pretty bad. <laughs> but I looked at my girlfriend. I said, you know, I kind of want to go to a, a real cigar store and see if there's, like, something better. Right. So I went to a mall, and in the mall was, like, this old kind of tinderbox-style store. Yep. Uh, Sherman Oaks Galleria was the place. It's an old mall that's not really there. It's kind of renovated to a different thing. but Sure. Sherman Oaks Pipe and Tobacco, I think it was called. Okay. And uh, I bought a cigar called Pleiades, or Pleiades. Hmm. Um, the French would say it, Pleiades. Okay. And... Uh, us Americans say Pleiades. Right. Um, the cigar had this whole, you know, star and moon and everything uh, theme to it. Can't even remember what size it, uh, it was called, but it was a Petit Corona, what we would call a Mareva. Okay. Uh, like a 42 ring gauge. Yep. And it was $2.50. Ooh, you're moving up. And I was afraid to tell my girlfriend. Because it's two dollars. I went from fifty cents to two dollars right. and fifty cents. It's gonna get expensive quick. Yeah, I was scared, and that was like premium back then. Two dollars yeah. and fifty cents. You're spending money, right? And so this is in ninety one, probably nineteen ninety one. And there was something so peaceful and and creamy and great about it that I was like, okay, this is what a real cigar is supposed to taste like. So I went down the rabbit hole big. I went really? to every cigar store in in Los Angeles, really? would go into every humidor, and I managed to, okay, I'm going to spend 5 bucks here, 10 bucks here, 12 bucks here, and I would smoke like one a day, and she would walk by me and go, that one smells really good. Get more of those. And I would, I would be like, well, yeah, but it doesn't taste good. So I'd go and find something else, and then one day... She goes, oh, that that one smells smells really good. I go, yeah, it actually tastes really good. It was a Davidoff Private Stock number eleven. Wow. Davidoff Private Stock used to be 
Davidoff Seconds. Okay. Now it's a manufactured brand where okay. now Private Stock is his own thing. It's no longer a Davidoff Second, Got but it. it used to be an actual Davidoff Second. And I think I bought my first box. It was fifty dollars. Ooh. Yeah, for the whole box. I went. I went deep, and I bought a. I bought a full box. The disappointing wow. part about Davidoff Private Stock back then is the, the boxes didn't have lids. They just had a piece of paper that flapped over the top. So I was like, oh, man, it's not complete. Yeah. What am I going to store in it? Right. Um, yeah. Th then I uh, I went for a brief uh, period of time where I was actually uh, working as a bouncer in a strip club. I wasn't so much of a bouncer, more as a floater. I'd be the guy that would walk around and make sure that everybody was doing their job and and call over one of the giant guys to yeah. help me if something needed Systems, to get done. Systems, please. <laughs> um, but I was really interested in being in the cigar industry. Okay. And I went into a shop, that Gus's Smoke Shop. There was two shops that I went to, Cigar Warehouse and Gus's Smoke Shop. They were right on, both on Ventura Boulevard. Okay. About five miles away from each other, three miles away. Uh, different clientele, different style humidor. Um, and I went into Gus's Smoke Shop, and I became friendly with their clerks. And I said, how much would it cost to open up a cigar store? And I th think they thought I was trying to open up competition for them. Right, I would too. And this is like right in the beginning of when cigars were becoming hot again. So everybody saw money. I'm like, right. I want to open up my own store, but I want to go to my hometown of Maine, you know, home state of Maine, and open up a, a cigar shop next to a coffee shop with a door in between them. Right. That way. Best of both worlds. Yeah, which is funny because Burn here in, in Minneapolis yeah. is that or was that was at one that, time. Yeah. They still have the doors just sealed up. Yeah. So that's what I wanted when I was younger. And uh, they're like, oh, it's going to be about $100,000. I don't have $100,000. <laughs> so it, I remember waking up one morning and I was going to go ask Cigar Warehouse. Uh, Larry Wagner was his name. I was going to ask Larry to see if he had, like, a part-time job so I could become an apprentice or, right. you know. Learn even if ways. he didn't pay me. I just wanted to work wow. in a cigar store. Work for free. Because um, I really, there was something about the industry that was, seemed intriguing to in me. So I uh, went to the, the strip club, and in walks um, one of the guys from Gus's Smoke Shop. Down below, right? Yeah, is, yeah is the ready? other store. Okay. He comes he comes into the strip club and he goes, I knew you were working day, so I, I came in to see you. I didn't come here to see the show. I came in to see you. And I said, What's up? He goes, Would you want a Sunday job? I go, Doing what? He goes, Working at Gus's. I go, Hell yeah. Yeah. Every Sunday I go, Yeah, absolutely. He goes, your main job is going to be mixing our, our pipe tobaccos because right. we have a lot of clients for pipes and pipe tobacco, and we're going to need someone in the back. Mixing it all Getting up. your hands dirty. Ooh. I was like, okay, I'm in. So I think within six months I became their buyer. Yeah, because I was so serious into cigars, and cigars started getting so like crazy, and I would study every cigar. I knew every cigar in the humidor and i knew every price point of every cigar wow. so they're like christmas time came they're like you're at the register because right. someone would walk up with 10 cigars and i knew every price i was a numbers yeah. kid when i was younger <laughs> so it was easy to remember things sure. plus i would like where's pete he's in the humidor looking at cigars where's pete he's in the humidor looking at cigars wow so i went really through every cigar in the humidor taking it all in but I was also the guy that would like, hey, uh, people, what do you want? What do you want to smoke? They're like, I don't know, something different. I go, trust me, when you when you try this cigar, you're going to enjoy it. A little bit rustic, but you're going to enjoy the cigar. And it was a sure. Henry Clay Brava. Okay. Henry Clay Henry Clay Bravas were, you know, back in the old days, and still you can find them. They'd be packed really wet in the bundle, and they'd be smushed. So ne not any cigar was round. Yeah. They all had edges to them, and they were kind of like triangles and just kind of awkward looking. But every person I turned on to them still smokes them to this day. Nice. Uh, a quick story. I was in Northern California just this uh, 
was it June, to do an event with Dan. Yep. At a place called uh, Mission Pipe San Jose. And a guy walks in, and I was like, man, this guy has a familiar face. But, you know, I don't remember everybody. And we get to talking. Next thing you know, he's like, uh, he's in the sporting industry, and he, he likes to go hunting, but he's also just, he's a, just an active bodybuilder, and like, just good dude. And he goes, you have like those, those cigars, like the best moment cigars? And I go... Yeah, I have a few, but it's hard to, to kind of name them all. I go, sure. I can't name one as right. like, what's your best one? He goes, he goes, I got five. That's what he says to me. He goes, I got five. I go, I probably could say name off five and, and not put them in any particular order. But right. So we start going through a few of them. And he goes, man, and he goes, there's this one cigar that I had that I was in. I was in. Sherman Oaks or Studio City, California, and there was a store on the north side of Ventura Boulevard, and the sales clerk sold me this really kind of ugly Henry Clay. It was you. And it was the best cigar that I had smoked in a long time. And I go, I sold you that cigar. Right. And he looks at me and goes, holy shit. The guy actually started tearing up. Really? Just, just the shock value of... Like that was you. That he, I was part of that one of his favorite it was moments. One of his top five. Yeah, so it was just. That's awesome. And I even told him it, uh, and he remembered. He goes, "You told me that they're ugly, <laughs> but don't judge a book by its, its cover. You'll you'll be pleasantly surprised." And he goes, "That cigar had flavor." He goes, it, "I picked it up, you know, after I I bought it and looked at it. And I'm like, there's no way that this is going to be good, and." I think that's probably why Altadas asked me to do the Henry Clay project because I always still talk about right. how big advocate of it. I there's some Henry Clay for me is one of those cigars that just holds like a soft spot. Sure. It it's just stuck in my memory. You know exactly what it's supposed to taste like. Even now if I pick one up and it doesn't taste like Henry Clay, I'm like that's disappointing. Sure. Or when I see someone complain that they bought some Henry Clay's and they had a problem with it. The like, ones that you blended with Monte Cristo? No, the, that, but also with uh, the regular even the regular one. ones. I'm like, I get dis- I get saddened by it because right. it, that Can't should really be just it. always there. Right. Some things you should count on, you know? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the bus tour. Because <laughs> you, had, you had Danny in last night, and Danny is with... Remind me again. Dan Welsh uh, works uh, for us. Um, he is called Surrogate Dan. Yeah. He's uh, he's the the face of surrogates. Okay. Surrogate. He's been a longtime friend of mine. And uh, when we started, uh, and I had the idea to come up with Atelier, which was like the workshop for Tatawai. I said, Dan, why don't, why don't we just roll surrogates into Atelier also? And you can be, you know, the... Surrogate Dan, the face of surrogates, the brand manager, you know, the brand owner. Right. You know, and actually be part of this whole project. And uh, a lot of times now he's been helping out me and my brother's been helping out me, like, lessen my road travel so I can actually be in Nicaragua a little bit more or by my partner's side more often. Yeah. (laughs) But no, they've they've taken a lot of – it's hard to, like, split up. The amount of travel, yeah. um, because I used to do lot. it all myself. Sometimes I didn't even have sales reps, so I'd actually fly into a city and get a rent a car, and I'd drive around so. myself. And then sooner or later, everybody wants me to come in to do an event. I'm like, it's impossible that I can be everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, I uh, it's good to have backup. And Dan and Casey have been yeah. very helpful with all You guys that. were just at Tobacco Grove last night doing an event. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great event. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. Um, great store. Yeah. Great store. Great people. Yeah. Um, That's my hometown shop. A lot of, That's like, where I used a lot to of Saints and Sinners people here. Yeah. Man, but I heard a lot. There were some guys that drove in from North, North Dakota also. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So, no, we had a great time. So the road, the road tour, the bus tour... Kind yeah. of being on a tour bus sounds sort of glamorous. Sounds sort of like, oh man, that could also be kind of crappy. So, what are the yeah? What's your best and what's your worst moment being on that <laughs> tour bus? Okay, so uh, 
the bus tour came up as a conversation with um, so Sean Johnson, we call him Casper, who is a, yeah. a partner with me in Saints and Sinners. He uh, he was looking for some things for for me to do like marketing. And he goes, "How about doing a tour on a tour bus?" I'm like, "Dude, I have no no clue what that's all about." My right. my idea of a tour was in a you know. A, a van with no windows with all of our equipment in the back and I was sleeping on top of an amp. <laughs> that's that's my idea of a tour. But he used to run tours, right? Yeah, so Casper. he used to run tours and he used to work with a lot of uh, pretty well-known bands. Sure. And um, he goes, no, he goes, I can even map it out for you. You can do the routing. Perfect. So we start at Atelier. In, include Sean in the, in the mix. So Sean, my brother Casey, and then uh, Dan. And the, the me were the made the four sides of the square for sure. Atelier, and uh, it was supposed to be like this brainstorming workshop session for like the the four of us to come up as a a group and do, do all the decisions. Trip. Yeah, and then the the bus idea said, okay, we're gonna do this bus. We're gonna park it at the trade show in Orlando in Jeff Borschwitz's parking lot. And then from the trade show, we're going to leave on a 19-day trip. And then uh, I looked at him. I said, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do this. So we, <laughs> we didn't do it. It took about, I guess it would have been five years later, we finally said, let's try this bus tour thing. He knew all the right people to contact. He knew how to get you know the, the bus done, right? the driver, the whole thing. I mean, the first tour was awesome, man. I mean, like. I, you're on a tour bus. You're living right. on a tour bus. I mean, the only time we get a hotel, we have a hotel for the driver. Yep. And we have an extra hotel room for us to shower in. Sure. That's it. But we sleep on the bus. We live on the bus. We, you know, have lunch on the bus. We right. order pizza to the bus. You know? <laughs> um, it's a fun way to bond. Right. I think... Just in general, the whole experience is a lot of fun. Just seeing the countryside yep. and seeing all the different things uh, that you don't get to see when you're flying on a plane. Right. I think the most uh, aggravating experience is last tour. We were in Nashville, and we pulled into a parking lot to uh, to turn around. Yeah. And our driver... At, there was a hump in the road. Yep. And our driver, instead of turning right out of the parking lot, which would have been the easy one, he decides to pull into traffic, across traffic. Ooh. But has to go slow because there was traffic coming. Yep. And he wanted to make sure that they saw him pulling into traffic. And he pulled in slow, and we got to the middle and, and bottomed out. We were a little <laughs> we were teetering. We weren't nothing. We put things under the, the tires. We couldn't move. Right. They called the tow truck in. Instead of getting a big tow truck, they brought in a regular sized <laughs> tow truck. And the guy did a wheelie trying to pull the, the 45,000 pound bus. Yeah, it's not going to work. And then uh, you need a big rig. Finally, they brought in the wrecker. And the wrecker pulled us like 20 inches, and we were out. It was like a $1,000 lesson on what not to do. <laughs> that was an expensive turn. Yeah. Yeah, but that, I, I can't really say that. Uh, I mean, we always take time to to do fun things. Sure. So, like, we made sure that twice we went to Willet. Oh, okay. <laughs> we had to make sure we stopped at Willet as part of the tour. Yep. Like, hey, this routing works, and we can go by Bardstown, Kentucky, at the same time. So we'd make a detour up to Bardstown and come back down and finish the tour. Sure. So, I think. The toughest part would be the long drives. Yeah, but just being I mean, on the road. I I don't think there was really a bad moment other than like the embarrassment moment of watching the cops come and be like, <laughs> "What if you tried to push the truck or the push the bus?" <laughs> and we're like, "This thing's forty five thousand pounds. We're not pushing this bus." Yeah, hey, we'll meet you out back. Yeah, and you start pushing. That's fun. Cool. You talked a little bit about the wine. You've you've gone off and made your own wine. Yeah, again, I don't make anything. Well, um, I create things. Correct. I design Created things. Created a brand, um, wine company. I rely on the best people in the world to make it. I can't afford to live in Bordeaux. I can't afford yeah. to travel to Bordeaux eight, ten times a year. 
Right. So the twice, two times a year that I would actually get to go over there, I would sit in a room with a bunch of bottles and a bunch of beakers, and I would blend into wine glasses and buy percentages and find the perfect balance of what I thought was a good wine. Sure. And once I settle on that, they do all the rest of the work. I just... It's a vanity project, you know? Yeah. It's fun, but... Uh, right. Fun creative outlet. It's a creative element, but it's... You're not... But even... If you think about it. Chateau owners don't sit there and walk through the chateau and, and load barrels. They have people right. that do that. Right. And there's people that are trained perfectly to do those things. You know, the reality is Pepin and Jaime aren't going in and flipping pulones themselves. Right. They have people that do it when they're supposed to do it. In the old days, they used to. Yeah, you had but to. now it's it's impossible. You try sure. to put Jaime in every portion of the factory every day of the week, every minute of the day, it's not going to happen. Right. He's got other business. What is it about the cigar industry and the wine industry that you see as far as similarities? And also, how can they kind of like either learn from each other or kind of incorporate the same thing? Well, weather has a lot to do with it. Weather, you know, too much rain with, with the wine... You get overly watered uh, grapes, sure. too much rain in, in uh, tobacco. You get drunk tobacco, and it becomes too thin. And next thing you know, it ha loses its flavor and its character. Sure. So there's a lot of similarities when it comes to weather. Cultivation's a little different, obviously, because in you know they both have harvest season. Mm -hmm. But in tobacco, you harvest in stages. In wine, you got to harvest all of it. You know, at once the vine for wine stays in the ground, tobacco, the stock gets removed completely. Yep. So there's the differences, but, you know, and then there's the varietals, the, the different varietals of, you know, grapes and the different varietals of tobacco. Mm -hmm. And all those different varietals create different flavors right. and different profiles. So when you have a Cabernet, and you mix it with a Merlot, you're going to get these different characters that kind of mingle and sometimes help and maybe sometimes fight after each other. Sure. Same thing with tobacco. Sometimes Criollo and Corojo marry really well together, but if you're not positioning them correctly on the cigar, they might fight with each other. Sure. Um, and there's, there's just so many different dynamics. So I look... I try to correlate a tobacco seed varietal with a wine seed varietal. So like Cabernet, that would be like Corojo, you know, okay. or Merlot would be like Habano. Um, stuff like that. Pelo de Oro would be like, you know, Petit Verdot. So you're talking about sure. small, small batch stuff that, uh, or small growing amounts of tobacco that you don't see much of that you're like, I'm going to picture it as this. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, okay, Cabernet, that's this. So I did a wine with Yanni in Bordeaux. I took her to, when they won the f number one for Florida Las Antillas, I was going to France to work on one of my wines. Sure. And I said, honey, you got to do your own wine. She goes, I don't know what, what are you talking about? I go, you don't want like a whole barrel of wine to celebrate your number one rating from Cigar Aficionado. I go, I think it's a good thing for your family to have just as a right something to remember she goes well i don't know what i'm doing i go i got this don't worry right i go i'm gonna pair every wine with every seed varietal every grape varietal is gonna become a seed varietal in, in tobacco i need you to call your dad for me and ask him one question and she goes what i go ask him we're in bordeaux at the time she goes what am I supposed to ask him? I go, ask him if he were to put together his favorite blend at this moment, what seed varietals would they be and in what percentages would they be? And he mapped it all out. Wow. And I said, okay, Habano, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, um, Criollo, oh no, Corojo, Criollo, Cabernet Sauvignon. And we went in and I did the same percentages of those juices. How'd it turn out? And originally I said, go through all these Cabernets and pick your favorite. She'd go through all of them. She goes, okay, that's my favorite. Okay. I go, go through all these Merlots and pick your favorite. Same thing, Cabernet Franc, same thing. And then I said, this is where we start. I need 
30% of that, 30% of that, and 40% of that. Or it was like 35, 35, 30 or something like that. Sure. And uh, they put it together for us. We're like, it's missing something. So we go through, like, okay, what's your second favorite Cabernet here? She tastes so she goes, that's my second favorite. I go, let's take out 10% of that Cabernet and add 10% of this Cabernet in place of it. So we still keep the blend component ratios the same. Yep. But we're now we're just using more vineyards. And that's what it ended up being. I think, I can't remember if she used like five different vineyards, but she, oh. she kept with the same ratio. Sure. The wine's really good. Nice. Like re- really good. And I looked at her, I said, you know, you, you pretty much picked every of the most expensive vineyards that they have to <laughs> offer. But the wine's really good. Uh, good. I did all the, uh, all the artwork for it. Well, I took their artwork uh, of the Florida Las Antillas artwork, and I yep. made a label, a wine label out of it. Got it. And then I wrote a little story how she came to uh, make this blend off of her father's favorite uh, tobacco blend. And uh, it's a nice little tribute, you know. Yeah, something special. You know, That's fun. 300 bottles for the family to kind of celebrate with. Celebrate with. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, so they have it at their office in Nicaragua. And Jaime's got a big lounge there. So I made sure I sent my wine down there. And he's got his their family wine in the in the bar. Sure. Seems that my wine gets opened up more than theirs. <laughs> um, they like let's to, pull out a Pete stuff. Yeah, let's just drink Pete stuff. We'll save ours for later. But That's uh, good. I think there's there's a direct correlation to all that because the expression of blending and the expression of you know writing writing a song yeah. is like making a new wine is like making a new cigar. Right. Um, it's just the whole art part of it. It's sitting down and painting a painting or writing a story. I mean, they're all expressions. Right. And, uh, but I think wine and cigars are pretty, pretty awesome. damn close. So I, I follow a path. I also like, I actually like regulation, not FDA level. Right. But I like self regulation. Yep. There's too much bullshit in our industry and there's too many people that, make up grandiose stories that they, sure. you know, had it shoved up their ass for a long time. And <laughs> I actually think I heard Skip say that. Yeah. Yeah. He's- <laughs> you know, there's too much bullshit. And I used to call a lot of people on their bullshit. Like they used to tell these grandiose stories. And I'm like, You're full of crap, man. Right. You know, like just be honest with people. Tell people, you know, what you're doing. Don't, don't try to right. sell them on this mystery story that, that, you you massage this leaf with Kobe beef before you roll it in the cigar, you know. It's and good. We're all doing pretty much the same thing. We're yeah, just trying what, to outdo each other. That's what that's Pete it. said. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the same material to work with. It's just the way you put it together. Yeah. Like like that wine. Yeah. Yeah, the same material to work with. It's just you took a different way and, of blending it. Most of the guys do it all the same. There's some people that, you know, have their tricks and they, they like to do things differently, but a good percentage of the time, most people are doing the exact same thing, but you're never going to get the same cigar mm-hmm. from different factories. There's too many variables. All the the way they roll it, the way they bunch it, uh, the way they age the leaf, uh, the right. way they, you know, let the pilones get up to certain temperatures before they flip it. You know, maybe some people do it. Oh, we want to push it to a different level and let it get a little higher. Sure. You know, so there's all these different dynamics that you can't. There's no way that, that right. Skip could make a Tatuaje taste like a Tatuaje. Right. But I can't make aroma taste like aroma. Right. It's just not there. Now I can see why you gravitated towards it, because it's the same reason why I gravitated towards it. It's like it's so unique, and there's so many variables. It's fun to try, try to like nitpick that apart and be like, wow, that's really how that Well, you used to play created. with pipe tobacco, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I worked at Tobacco Grove, so that was like part of what I was doing. But would is- you actually play? Like not a hundred percent, but like it's it's fun. We had a couple of guys that we would have to make their blend, so I was like, okay, I wonder why um, Boone's blend is the way it is, and yeah. it's like because he picked this. So I'd go ask him, like, why did you, you know? And so it was more interesting for me to find out, like, Personal. I am you, like, why why are you making it yeah. this way? Or 
you know, why is it created that way? It gets very personal when it comes to blending for yourself. And everything that I do is really blended for me. I don't, the bonus right now is that everybody else seems to like it, but all the cigars right. have to be enjoyed by me because I can't, I can't smoke them. I can't sell them. Sure. If I, if I can't really feel, you know, with all my right. heart that, I believe that this is a great cigar. I can't tell you that it's a great cigar. So Well, and you have a lot of different brands. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. there's a lot out there that you've created and and taking basically a brand from zero to where it is now, I mean, that's a big feat in and of itself. So are you creating all these different brands to For me to smoke? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I mean, I I want different expressions. It's like um you know, a chef, he makes his dish, you know, for the restaurant, but he might take that same dish and add a little extra whatever right. to it to make it his own so he can have it and enjoy it. A lot of times with chefs, though, they'll do exactly what I'm doing is they'll make it taste exactly how they want it and they'll let everybody else have it too. Gotcha. Um, so it's disappointing for a chef even when they get someone that says, that dish that you made was horrible. Like, yeah, for sure. At that point, the chef kind of like washed his hands with it in a sense because he's got a sous chef that's supposed to be cooking it exactly the same way he, he right. cooked it. Maybe the sous chef did something wrong. Sure. Wasn't paying attention or the line cook did something wrong, wasn't paying attention. So I think that's why chefs are um, very similar to like people who blend anything, right. wine makers or, it's craft. or cigar makers yeah. or even whiskey makers. It's just... Like when I was at the pipe tobacco, back to the pipe tobacco, so I used to always go like, how much if, how much is this blend gonna change if I add, right, another half ounce of Perique? Like, what's gonna change? Like, where am I gonna go? Right. And there was always that challenge. Okay, I like these flavor profiles, so I like the Perique, that little extra bump of Perique. What happens when I add some? black Cavendish in there too to give it a little vanilla note so now I'm mixing English and traditional or in, traditional English style blends with with aromatics right what's going to go on here are they going to fight with each other or they, is it going to be some crazy unique experience and right. that's where a blend like Frog Morton from uh, yeah. McClellan that was kind of like a hybrid it had the English notes to it but it had those characters of sweetness so it was like a you told me you were picking apart that Frog Martin, and you were trying. Yeah, to like we, blend we it did our own life. version of it. Yeah, have fun yeah. with it and tweak it and yeah, make it yours. Pete, another thing that we all know about you, maybe not everyone knows, but I definitely know you like animals. Yeah, I love them, and particularly these dogs. And we've named a couple. Hunter was your first. Havana second. Havana your second. Cuba third, and Kona uh, fourth, and uh, we have a mascot that that doesn't belong to uh, me but uh he comes to the office named arnold right. big big rottweiler about yeah. a 130 140 pounds wow yeah so but a sweetheart in your lines mm -hmm. you have placed some hidden meaning uh or put these dog names yeah in your usually blends. after they pass in some way right yeah to honor them or to to carry that through yeah it's just personal yeah Name some of the areas that you've put these names into. Well, Cazador, obviously, uh, yep. means hunter in Spanish. Um, so the uh, Seleccion, Seleccion de Cazador, yep. grammatically it should be La Seleccion del Cazador, which is the selection of the hunter. Okay. But in this case, it's the selection of hunter. Got it. Or it's hunter's selection, um, not the hunter's selection. So it's always been part of the brand name uh, for Tatawahe. And then uh, Havana, when she passed, the Garcias had just opened the new factory in Nicaragua. And uh, I needed to make a new line because uh, Miami production was maxed out. Yep. And we had this big facility to work in in Nicaragua. And I decided to call it Havana 6, where I took six cigars six old style sizes and made like a line out of it and called it havana six nice um and then cuba when he passed i didn't really do anything ultra premium but i uh 
was starting the tattoo line, and I decided to do all four uh, beginning letters of uh, the the words that I used to yep. spell out Cuba. So Caballero, Universo, uh, um, Bonito, and Adivino. Okay. Same thing which, which I did with... Uh, Brown Label, right? With Brown Label and Havana 6. Okay. Because they all spell out their names. So, so the, the original Brown Label spells out Hunter. Hunter, yeah. The original Havana 6 spells out Havana. So the names of the sizes are spelling yeah, out so the dog's names. Like Angeles and, uh, you know, Hermosos and Victorias. And so right. they all have their own way. So then that's the, un- the other reason why I have... Uh, the Casadori called Havana Casadori because yep. it was a you know it was a combination of two dogs Havana's hunter you know right what and then uh, Bonami right well Bonami is a wine I did okay that's a wine but it's named after Kona right uh yeah well it's actually named after all it's kind of like a tribute to dogs okay in general um if you read the back of the the Bonami label you like everybody who reads it like. Oh, like I, I got dust in my eye, like uh, because it's one of those. It's a dedication to, you know, a man's best friend, a woman's best friend, um, to to dogs, um, but it's spelled B O N E. Yep. And I've actually had some French people like, "Yeah, you spelled it wrong." I go, "No, it's a play on words." It's right. Got a picture of my dog on the logo. Right. On the on the uh, on the label. So that was that was just something that something fun that I did uh, as a more of a personal thing sure um but yeah with kona who was the last one who's on that label he he got his own cigar out of miami called the k222 now that one i heard has some pretty deep meaning to it with the k and the triple two well explain that that's pretty that's an impactful story so kona died at 222 p.m and uh it was just one of those things that stuck out, like, okay, 222. So we started looking into it, and we found out it was an angel number. Really? And angel numbers, you know, some people believe in them, and I actually am starting to get creeped out by them uh, because they, I, I see them constantly. That sure. number is – it's supposed to be when that number shows up in your life, it's just a reminder that they're watching over you or protecting you. Right. So I see it everywhere. I'll pick up my phone and it will be 2.22 p.m. I wake up a lot at 2.22 a.m. in the morning. I got checked into a hotel the week I was launching the cigar in Hawaii. The K22? The K222. Um, and, of course, I am in Hawaii and, you know, his name's Kona. And, right. And I'm launching the K222 at this event. And I get upgraded, and they give me my room key, and it's sweet two two two, <laughs> like creepy, right? Right. I or see it coming? everywhere, like it's. I get bills at restaurants that are two hundred and twenty two dollars. Like weird. It it's everywhere for me. So I don't know if it's just because I know the number yeah. that I'm paying attention to it more, but I. I saw three license plates in one day that ended with 222. Just yeah. weird. Significant. But memory. every time I see it once, I'm like, okay, I'm probably going to see it again. But I always expect to see it at least three times in a day. Really? So if I see it Sequence once, I know I'm going to see it three times. Wow. I, Interesting. I don't know why. Yeah, it's like, uh, like he's nudging you. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. strange, creepy. That's uh, cool. Sometimes I get a little freaked out. Well, we're coming to the end of the the conversation, but I do have a little fun bit that I want you to finish the quote. You ready for this? Okay. All right. You may know these, you may not. We'll find out. I probably don't. <laughs> the best cigar is the one in your hand. Okay. That's Who my said line. that? <laughs> oh, you did? That's oh, me. really? That's. Quote, unquote, Pete Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I may have known that. A seat for every? Seat for every ass. And that's because you make a bunch of cigars. Yeah. And that's- we, we say that, it's that I think that was always a, a Casper thing. 
He's sure. like a seat for every ass. But then it turned into, okay, we make a seat for every ass and a price point for every wallet. Because uh, we have a cigar that can be enjoyed by anybody. Right. Because there's so many different flavor profiles. Sure. So you're going to find one, at least one. If you yep. don't find one, then I'm severely disappointed. Right. Gotta but the price the points, we go all the way from, I don't know, two something all the way to right. 30 something. So we have like a price point for every wallet. So anybody can afford the product and and hopefully everybody can find at least one cigar that, that really fits a warehouse. The problem is sometimes you get a guy who's like, the one I only, the only one I liked in your line is the twenty-two dollar one. <laughs> I can't afford twenty-two dollars. I'm like, sorry right. about that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. And your Desert Island cigar is the Havana Cazadori in the brown label. Yeah. So in the original selection of Cazador, the Havana Cazadori, six and three eighths by forty-three. Real. Perfect. Just perfect. Yeah. yeah. I can never go wrong with it. Plus, it means something. So. Right. It's the personal side, and plus the size is awesome. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the Monster Series, because yeah. I learned a little bit from uh, Charlie Minato over uh-huh. at Half Wheel. He said your second box that you did, you painted the inside, oh, so. and how tough that was. I was on... just talking about that at breakfast, <laughs> man. It was like the worst thing ever. Because the cigars all smelled like paint, right? Well, yeah. The problem was that they got boxed, and they got shipped from Nicaragua to Miami and then Miami to LA and as soon as I opened up the master card so this was a very quick period yeah probably about 10 days total you know freight freight wow and uh, the boxes were painted a little too close to when the cigars needed to go into them so I literally like got to this point where people are like no it smell they, they smell like paint I'm like okay this is a total clusterfuck. Either right. I'm going to take all the cigars back and just trash the whole project, or I'm going to need to figure something out. So I put out a message out in social media on all the forums that were available at the time. I said, listen, if anybody has any problems with the cigars, please contact me directly, and I'm going to replace the sure. cigars. Just get them back to me, and I'll give you a fresh 13 new ones. Yep. The problem is a lot of these collectors, they didn't want to even open up the box. And I was right. telling people, take the cigars out of the box, let the cigars breathe, and let the box breathe outside the humidor. Right. It just, the box was still wet yeah. on the inside. That's the dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> Man, oh my God. But a really successful project though, right? I a mean, hugely successful project. I mean, you've like, sold from like... some. I think Charlie calls it... Like, for some people, that's a brand. Exactly. Because just, just you went from, like, what, 2,000 or, like, less than 2,000 all the way? Now it's up to, I like, 50,000 like some uh, odd 10,000 sticks, just under 10,000 sticks the first year. Okay. And now it's, every year is about 55, 60,000. Right. And for some people, that's a whole brand. But, uh, yeah, the, the painting the inside boxing, the <laughs> dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> I just thought it was, like... It's going to look like red velvet on the inside. Yeah, That's awesome. Like a casket, right? Yeah, and it's a Dracula. It was a so this Dracula is perfect. Box. It this looked like perfect. a coffin. And then people start calling me, and I open up a box. I was like, fuck. Dang it. Yeah, these smell like it smells paint. a little bit like primer there. But if you let it s- sit and bleed out, That's it bled right. out. It was just that initial shock. Right. But that, too soon. Too soon. Too soon. You could have uh, let them rest and yeah. Put if the you boxes let the cigars away. rest and you let the the box rest, the cigars eventually dissipated anything that right. But yeah, that was man. Bummer. I'm guessing if the FDA were involved, it'd be fined really heavily. <laughs> <laughs> you selling paint chips over here? <laughs> yeah, that was a dumb move. And even now to this day, uh, the paint thing really affects me. Uh, okay. So I have a rule that if they're gonna do any boxes, even though it's the outside of the box. I'm like, these boxes need to be painted and sat and rested for a few months before the cigars go in them. Perfect. Because I don't want any inkling of like, oh, the cigars taste like the box. Right. I think my favorite one was though, I, I used uh, melamine. You know, melamine, it's like a hard plastic. Yep. Use melamine to uh, pack um, black labels in, in a jar, like a melamine yes. jar. Yes. 
And I melamine has no odor to it. Right. Like, <laughs> no taste, no odor to it, unless you're chewing on melamine. Right. But I don't know who wants to chew on plastic. Maybe a dog. And someone's like, yeah, I got my, my jar of black labels, and they, they taste like the jar that they're in. <laughs> like, like nothing? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, it's not going to impart any flavor, so. Right. I made that mistake once. I'll never do it again. Exactly. Very heightened mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Really so, good. Yeah. Don't ever, if anybody ever wants to start a cigar brand, don't ever paint the inside of a box. Actually, I know a manufacturer that did it um, after I did it, and he called me and says, what'd you do? And I go, well, I offered to take the cigars back, mm-hmm. and I told everybody to take the cigars out of the box. And, of course, everybody's like, if I take it out of the box, it it's loses its it. value. Yeah. Yeah, I've now opened the seal on my... You created that monster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, another reason why I've called the monster series my nightmare. Yeah. Because of stupid things like painting the inside of the box. Right. And always the distribution is never easy. Sure. Yeah, it's like limited I, production. I got five last year. How come I only got three? Right. Like, because the guy who did less than you last year is now ahead of you right and he deserves more so yeah it's like it's tough it's a nightmare i'm glad i'll be glad when it's kind of over at least where i don't have to create any more monsters when is it going to be over this year's my last monster okay because you ran it for 13 i did it for 11 there's two other monsters chuck and tiff okay that i count as 11 and 12 to disappointment of Charlie Monado, he does not like <laughs> the fact that I, I did that. Um, they were never released, or what? They were released, but in in different styles. Not never dress box. In, not in their own individual dress box. So then, how are you counting them as a monster series? <laughs> you, you're breaking. I actually mold. saw, I actually saw a post the other day of someone photoshopped two little boxes in between <laughs> uh, the Michael and the bride. Yeah. And he photoshopped two little boxes. <laughs> Chuck, number 11, and Tiff, number 12. <laughs> and he goes, please feel free to use this artwork. Just please help me with my ADD and, and, and do this for me. Why'd you break cycle on those? I, you know what? I got tired. I, I like, like, I know I can recycle through the original uh, full-size monsters. And think about it. People haven't had a Frank in 11 years. Right. They might want one again. So sure. it'd be nice to go back to the beginning. Yeah. Maybe change up the production a little bit. Maybe even go smaller. Uh, smaller. Well, Ooh. maybe just go back to only dress boxes. Okay. Um, That'd be fun. And don't do the plain boxes. Not make it such a big production. Sure. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's great to make a lot of cigars. You make a lot of money. But at the end of the day, really, is it all that fulfilling sometimes? I mean, yeah, I don't know. That's a question not for everything. you, man. Was the Monster Series fulfilling to you? When I first started it, yeah. And then the second year when I had the paint <laughs> mishap, no. And the third year was kind of redemption. Sure. And then the fourth year, people were like, okay, this is really good. And then the fifth year, they're like, oh, I don't really like this one as much. Packaging was awesome, but everybody, they're sure. like, it's a really boring monster. Um Fulfilling for creativity, yes. Yeah. But I feel like, I don't know, sometimes I've I've thought, like, I don't really have much more to offer. Really? Yeah. I don't know. That's just me new overthinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to... I told Jaime and Babine the other day that I was bored and I needed something. Like, I needed something more sure. fulfilling. Even if they told me, hey, okay... You're going to go run the pig facility. <laughs> I'd probably go, okay, sure. Just sure. tell me what to do. Got it. So have cigars been kind of, is it, are you bored now with cigars? No, I'm, 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 I'm kind of um, a little scared about the future. Okay. Um, I'm really nostalgic when it comes to cigars. Yeah. And there's part of the whole history that seems to be disappearing. And the tradition that seems to be disappearing, 
and now it's become like an industry full of uh, skulls and co- crossbones. And I might have been one of those people that started that trend. Yeah. But I'd have to say that you you were definitely a culprit to that. I'm an old school, you know, the okay, Frankenstein crazy, you know, and everybody thought I was nuts for doing a, a, a themed cigar in a coffin shaped box. Right. But then uh, I still love the tradition. And I think that sometimes the industry is losing some of that tradition. So I like seeing projects like what Jeff Borschwitz is doing in Florida with the Florida Sun Grown. I like seeing projects like the Newmans are doing out of Tampa to reinvigorate, sure. you know, Tampa, the history of Tampa cigar making and doing right. cigars only made in the United States with 100% Miami or 100% USA made materials or right. whatever. That's why I think I'm paying more attention to Miami right now. Okay. That's why I'm having There's a some lot creativity of, that you're getting yeah. out of there. Nice. I think that's really what's sparking my my motivation right now is to being able to play in Miami and sure. go old school again. So a lot of my style has shifted back to the where the brand started. Is that what we're doing here? Yeah. Again, this is a fun little projects. These are would be comparable to like the Cuban custom rolls. So and again, Brown Label Miami was was me trying to make my own Cuban cigar brand. Sure. Uh, pay attention to the history, to the tradition. The packaging, everything, right? And I think that's what I'm kind of gravitating back towards. Yeah, you look back at some of your old boxes. I mean, even the way that the labels on the box and the way it's kind of looking, it, it all resembles old yeah. Cuban boxes. Yeah, I wanted to go straight after that market. Right. I didn't want to come. I didn't want to come in the industry and say, you know what, I'm going to do. I'm going to make the best knockoff to Opus X. Right. Why would I do that? Exactly. I'm going to make my best version of Padron. Why would I do that? Right. No, I'm going to make a cigar that tastes good. Yep. And I'm going to package it the way I feel an old school feeling cigar should have. My my original slogan from my company was old world for a new generation. That's all it was. It's great. Because I was really old school when it came to cigars, but there was a Put whole a new, twist, new twist of what I was doing. No one was making cigars that much in Miami at the time when we started Miami. Right. Um, people thought I was crazy. It's sure. an expensive cigar made in the United yeah. States during a part of the, the industry that was on downturn. And they, After most the of my boom. friends told me, said, probably won't sell many. Really? And I go, well, I know I can smoke them all. Yeah. If you get stuck with them, That's you like a, them. That, again, that, it goes back to the whole thing of like, if I can't sell them, I can smoke them. If you weren't doing anything in the cigar industry, what do you think you'd be doing? It's a tough question, but. Um, I actually, you know, possibly I might be back in music. Really? Yeah. What side? Production, playing, producing. I've I've actually threatened over the years with friends to uh, to get back into a group. Um, I've also threatened to maybe help produce some things. Sure. But there's something intriguing, and I know it's a dying breed, but. Because of all the, the technology out there now, you can make your own record at home. Yep. I always wanted to own a recording studio. I don't know why, but there's something nostalgic about it. Like I, Every once in a while, I'll go online to see if any recording studios are for sale. <laughs> well, why don't we just clear out some of that gene material and just set up shop right there? Well, that, that was, yeah. <laughs> Got a nice layout I, there. I'd, I'd actually, honestly, I would love to have like kind of like a speakeasy type of uh, lounge nice. where fans of the brand could go to yep, and kind of have it really be industrial and yep, you don't know it's there. I had the building right next door to me in Los Angeles was for sale at one time or sure. it wasn't for sale. I tried to buy it for that and, reason. Yeah. Nice. And I was going to put in a full, like, you know, sound room in there. So like if someone Bands wanted to come, come in, in and just jam out, Sure. And then the next room over was going to be a cigar lounge. And so if you look at the, so a buddy of mine owns uh, the dis- distribution for a guitar company called Duesenberg. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, he, Nathan. Did Nathan, you go to the concert? Yeah, I go to the concert every year yeah. at NAM, and it's amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. I, I, I always donate money or contribute money to that. That's how you get the that. tickets, so thank yeah. you very much. He, uh, he's got the coolest office in the world, and he, it's funny, though, because his office kind of mimicked my office 
on Sunset Boulevard. Mm. That's a talk about nostalgia. I wanted to have my office on Sunset Boulevard, the same streets I used to walk right. when I was being a, when I was a musician. So when I'd be home at lunch, I would go across the street to Guitar Center and pick up a guitar and just go play. jam around. Next thing you know, I'm buying guitars. <laughs> so it's expensive, Bobby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I have like I don't know seven Duesenbergs. Nice. Johnny Depp always plays at that concert. It's always fun to see him out there. Yeah. I have one of the Johnny Depp guitars, actually. Nice. Yeah. Those are beautiful guitars. I feel beautiful. like they get a lot of their um, lines from cars, like the logo Yo, of the car yeah. and yeah. That, that feathering out of the D. Yeah, everything and, about that brand is brilliant. It, and every every high-end guitar player has one. Yeah. They A lot of people don't talk about it because they don't get sponsored by like right. Duesenberg doesn't sponsor anybody. Right. Their marketing is just purely your relationships. Okay. And, um, but like, you know, you see Joe Walsh who, you know, promotes holding a fender on a, on a pop-up, but when he's in concert, he's playing a Duesenberg. Yeah. He's on stage with that. Yeah. Joe actually played the, that Johnny Depp show one year. Was it last year? Um, uh, I think it might have been three years Who's ago. Who's the gentleman from uh, Tom Petty's? Uh, that's a Mike Campbell. Mike Campbell was there yeah. last year. It he's was always, amazing. Yeah, he's always there. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, he Mike did Campbell. A cover. Did Joe Perry play this year with uh, Johnny Depp? I don't know. I'm Al- very Alice bad Cooper? with names. Yes. Yes. So Alice Cooper was there. Joe Perry would have been playing guitar. Okay. Um, from Aerosmith. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Sorry. Butch Walker was probably there. I'm about as good as names of musicians yeah. as I am basketball players. <laughs> and we all know how that goes. Who's the mailman? Uh, Carl Malone. Hey, you got that one. <laughs> Had a good, good interview with him, so it's great. Just He literally was like, you don't talk about sports, and I won't get up and leave. And I'm like, I'm your man. I don't know anything about sports. He's That's like, awesome. my man. That's <laughs> awesome. It's like, okay, this is off to a good start. He's not offended that I don't know who he is. So Yeah, I, uh, I, I think... Uh, I don't know. Again, a nice, a nice badass lounge would be awesome, but it's really I, I need to make it really feel kind of dark and like if I could throw some cigar smoking into Nathan's office, yeah, I'd be like, this is the most badass <laughs> cigar club ever. Because <laughs> he's got the guitars hanging everywhere, yeah. and it's just those are beautiful guitars. I've threatened to take the upstairs of my building yep. and and make it into a giant like you know lounge for people who come in it'd be, be nice, nice to clean up my building a little bit hey it's pretty weathered you need any help just call me yeah contractor you <laughs> no, know how I'll to come fix out. a roof <laughs> i'll come out no, i'll pick up stuff no, i can't fix anything <laughs> smoke cigars pick up i have jeans. a couple leaks in my roof i gotta get fixed otherwise this thing's gonna cave in so Uh-oh. all right well, well it's not that bad but still yeah yeah maybe a dog charity yeah I threaten to open up a kennel there you go in my home my hometown with up. my sister, because I was like, I need to do something. Yeah. Give back a little bit. Let's see. Problem is, I'd want to keep all the dogs. So. Well, it's it's rewarding. My uh, wife actually, she volunteers over at the Humane Society. Yeah. And that's how we actually came home with Henry. Um, she just brought him home one day. This was before I knew her, and uh, I said, let's not try to bring home any more dogs. <laughs> but she does get the satisfaction of matching people with the dogs. Yeah. Because you know the dog, right? And you understand its personality, and then you're kind of like, I don't know, you know, the, this dog is this way. It may not be a good fit for you, but let me show you this dog. So I think that's the rewarding part for her. That's cool. Being able to pair yeah. people with the right dog. Yeah. I, it's like being a cigar guy, right? You know, like, hey, well, what do you want to smoke? I, I think you should try this. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy to uh, talk to people and walk them through right. their profile to find. And when you're passionate about something yeah. and you're really invested in it, it's pretty easy then. Yeah. Yeah, I had a retailer that literally wanted to take me back to his store and and sit me in his store for a week because he's like, dude, I I I can't repeat all the things you've just said. Can <laughs> you just can you just like come back <laughs> and sit in my store for a week and let people listen? Right. I'm like, a lot of the stuff that I just said, you don't need to say. Right. I say it because I love every speck of it. Yep. Um, it's a little easier for you. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, I uh, cigar walking through a humidor with people. I'm like a I'm not a great salesman, but really, yeah, I've, I've never been 
like I'm going to sell this. Like, well, I can't no, do you're it. not. You're physically not doing the cliche selling thing. You're just pairing people with the right product. But I, I always get a little nervous when people ask me for an opinion on, like, what what do you want me to smoke in your brand? I'm like, dude, I have so much, and I don't really know your palate, and right. I have to go through that whole. What do you like? What do you normally smoke? What have you eaten today? Right. You know, what are you in the mood for? Yeah. Mild, medium, strong. So then you just this process of elimination. And, um, but, you know, I, I'm always nervous because I'm trying to pitch my my cigar to them and I'm afraid that they're... Not going to like it? They're not going to like it. Right. That's a reflection. Oh, you didn't pick out the right cigar. I had, a, I had a quick story. I had an old man um, that was from uh, Switzerland. He came in to the Grand Havana store because there was a small store below the Grand Havana Room Club upstairs. Yep. And he goes, I left Switzerland today or yesterday and I forgot all of my my cigars. Oh, wow. All of my Cuban cigars. And I know you guys can't sell Cubans here, but uh, what do you have that you think I might like? Some tatuajes. Well, no, I had, <laughs> I had tatuaje on the shelf. And it was very early on, like 2003, 2004. Hmm. And um, I said, well, there's a brand called Padron. I pointed to put Padrones. And I know Opus X, Fuente Opus X, you know, it's a really premier brand in the United States and right. in the world. And turned him on to a few that I really enjoyed that I think I thought he would like. And I didn't turn him on to a Tatawai. He literally goes, well, what's, what's this one right here? I go, well, it's a small brand, kind of local, Mine. but I didn't say it. <laughs> I know. Because I was, in, you know, Afraid that if right. you didn't like it, that oh well, yeah, yeah that keep working, make, kid. Yeah, yeah, stay behind and, the register, uh, right? He goes, well, let me try this one here, and he he lit the cigar up, and within, swear to God, like one puff, he goes, I'll take a box. This I was is like, good. Oh, this is good. You sure? And he goes, this reminds me of the the old Cubans that I have in my house. Wow. Because this, this guy like built tunnels for a living, so he had super amounts of money. So wow. he probably had a huge collection. Yeah. And uh, came back in the next day and bought another box. He goes, these are really good. These remind me more of old Cuba than the new Cubans that I'm getting. And I, and I said, uh, he goes, who makes it? I go, well, actually, it's, it's my brand. And he goes, they're tremendous. I'm going to buy another box, but I'm going to call you. Do you ship to Switzerland? I go, I don't even know how to ship to Switzerland. I'll figure it out. <laughs> and he called me like, I think it was like a month later. And he goes, I want to order 40 boxes of that cigar. Sure. I'm like, I don't have 40 boxes in inventory. <laughs> I literally had like 50 boxes of one size. And I had right. to ship to a couple of retailers. So I couldn't afford yeah. to take 40 out of the 50. I told him, I go, I might be able to do 20 boxes. He goes, well, when you get 40, that's what I want. And he ordered twice, and I still had no clue what I was doing. I went to FedEx, spent like $500 in shipping, <laughs> filled out all the customs forms. Yep. Hope to God they, they managed, get to He got them, wow, thank God. Good. Um, but the second order he placed was like 70 boxes. And I was like, and finally, I was like, you know, it's kind of complicated for me to ship this many. I go, I go. hopefully those 70 boxes last you for a while right. because I can't really do this all the time. Right. And by that time, I was running out of inventory for my own clients. So I even started saying, well, maybe you can order them directly from the factory in Miami. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, man. It's been I, a lot of fun. I love it. Sometimes I get a little long-winded, but I enjoy it. So thanks for having hey. me. Hey. We appreciate all the stories. Again, to check out any more of our episodes, go ahead and subscribe to the link below. And you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.